Good morning. Uh, what can I do for you? I want to report a theft. I had some things stolen out of my bag yesterday. I'm sorry to hear that. Right, so I'll need to take a few details. Can I start with your name? Louise Taylor. Okay, thank you. And are you resident in the UK? No, I'm actually Canadian, though my mother was British. And your date of birth? December 14th, 1977. So you're just visiting this country? That's right. I come over most summers on business. I'm an interior designer, and I come over to buy old furniture, antiques, you know? There are some really lovely things around here, but you need to get out to the small towns. I've had a really good trip this year, until this happened. Okay. So you've been here quite a while? Yes. I'm here for two months. I go back next week. So, may I ask where you're staying now? Well, at present, I've got a place at Park Apartments that's on King Street. I was staying at the Riverside Apartments on the same street, but the apartment there was only available for six weeks, so I had to find another one. Okay. And the apartment number? Fifteen. Right. Now, I need to take some details of the theft. So, you said you had some things stolen out of your bag? That's right. And were you actually carrying the bag when the theft took place? Yes. I really can't understand it. I had my backpack on, and I went into a supermarket to buy a few things, and when I opened it up, my wallet wasn't there. And what did your wallet have in it? Well, fortunately, I don't keep my credit cards in that wallet. I keep them with my passport in an inside compartment in my backpack, but there was quite a bit of cash there, about 250 pounds sterling, I should think. I withdrew 300 pounds from my account yesterday, but I did a bit of shopping, so I must have already spent about 50 pounds of that. Okay. At first I thought, oh, I must have left the wallet back in the apartment. But then I realized my phone had gone as well. It was only a week old, and that's when I realized I'd been robbed. Anyway, at least they didn't take the keys to my rental car. Yes. So you say the theft occurred yesterday? Yes. So that was September the 10th? And do you have any idea at all of where or when the things might possibly have been stolen? Well... At first, I couldn't believe it because the bag had been on my back ever since I left the apartment after lunch. It's just a small backpack, but I generally use it when I'm traveling because it seems safer than a handbag. Anyway, I met up with a friend, and we spent a couple of hours in the museum. But I do remember that as we were leaving there, at about four o'clock, a group of young boys ran up to us, and they were really crowding round us, and they were asking us what time it was. Then, all of a sudden, they ran off. Can you remember anything about them? The one who did most of the talking was wearing a T-shirt with a picture of something. Ah, uh, let's see. A tiger. Right. Any idea of how old he might have been? Around 12 years old? And can you remember anything else about his appearance? Not much. He was quite thin. Color of hair? I do remember that. He was blonde. All the others were dark-haired. And any details of the others? Not really. They came and went so quickly. Right. So, what I'm going to do now is give you a crime reference number so you can contact your insurance company. So, this is 10 digits. 87954-82361. Thank you. So, should I contact the... Good morning, everyone. My name's Janet Parker, and I'm the Human Resources Manager. We're very happy to welcome you to your new apprenticeship. I hope that the next six months will be a positive and enjoyable experience for you. I'd like to start with some general advice about being an apprentice. 
Most of you have very little or no experience of working for a big organization, and the first week or so may be quite challenging. There will be a lot of new information to take in, but don't worry too much about trying to remember everything. The important thing is to check with someone if you're not sure what to do. You'll find your supervisor is very approachable and won't mind explaining things or helping you out. You're here to learn, so make the most of that opportunity. You'll be spending time in different departments during your first week, so make an effort to talk to as many people as possible about their work. You'll make some new friends and find out lots of useful information. As well as having a supervisor, you'll each be assigned a mentor. This person will be someone who's recently completed an apprenticeship, and you'll meet with them on a weekly basis. Their role is to provide help and support throughout your apprenticeship. Of course, this doesn't mean they'll actually do any of your work for you. Instead, they'll be asking you about what goals you've achieved so far, as well as helping you to identify any areas for improvement. You can also discuss your more long-term ambitions with them as well. Now, I just want to run through a few company policies for our apprenticeship scheme with you. Most importantly, the internet. As part of your job, you'll be doing some research online. So obviously, you'll have unlimited access for that. But please don't use it for personal use. You'll have your own phones for that. Some of you have already asked me about flexible working. After your probationary three-month period, some of you will be eligible for this. But it will depend on which department you're in and what your personal circumstances are. So please don't assume you'll automatically be permitted to do this. I want to make sure there's no confusion about our holiday policy. Apart from any statutory public holidays, we ask that you don't book any holidays until after your six-month apprenticeship has finished. Time off should only be taken if you are unwell. Please speak to your supervisor if this is going to be a problem. You'll be expected to work a 40-hour week, but there may be opportunities to do overtime during busy periods. Although you're not required to do this, it can be a valuable experience. So we advise you to take it up if possible. Obviously, we understand that people do have commitments outside work, so don't worry if there are times when you are unavailable. As you know, we don't have a formal dress code here. You may wear casual clothes as long as they're practical. And the only restriction for shoes we have is on high heels for health and safety reasons. Comfortable shoes like trainers are preferable. There's a heavily subsidised canteen on site where you can get hot meals or salads cheaply. Snacks and drinks are also provided, so we've decided to introduce a no-packed lunch policy. This is partly to encourage healthy eating at work and partly to stop people from eating at their workstation, which is unhygienic. OK, moving on to... OK, so what I'd like you to do now is to talk to your partner about your presentations on urban planning. You should have done most of the reading now, so I'd like you to share your ideas and talk about the structure of your presentation and what you need to do next. OK, Rob, I'm glad we chose quite a specific topic, cities built next to the sea. It made it much easier to find relevant information. Yeah, and cities are growing so quickly. I mean, we know that more than half the world's population lives in cities now. Yeah, though that's all cities, not just ones on the coast. But most of the biggest cities are actually built by the sea. I'd not realised that before. Nor me. And what's more, a lot of them are built at places where rivers come out into the sea, but apparently this can be a problem. Why? Well, as the city expands, 
Agriculture and industry tend to spread further inland along the rivers, and so agriculture moves even further inland up the river. That's not necessarily a problem, except it means more and more pollutants are discharged into the rivers. So these are brought downstream to the cities? Right. Did you read that article about Miami on the east coast of the USA? No. Well, apparently back in the 1950s, they built channels to drain away the water in case of flooding. Sounds sensible. Yeah, they spent quite a lot of money on them. But what they didn't take into account was global warming. So they built the drainage channels too close to sea level, and now sea levels are rising, they're more or less useless. If there's a lot of rain, the water can't run away. There's nowhere for it to go. The whole design was faulty. So what are the authorities doing about it now? I don't know. I did read that they're aiming to stop disposing of wastewater into the ocean over the next 10 years. But that won't help with flood prevention now, will it? No, really, they just need to find the money for something to replace the drainage channels in order to protect against flooding now. But in the long term, they need to consider the whole ecosystem. Right. Really, though, coastal cities can't deal with their problems on their own, can they? I mean, they've got to start acting together at an international level instead of just doing their own thing. Absolutely. The thing is, everyone knows what the problems are and environmentalists have a pretty good idea of what we should be doing about them. So they should be able to work together to some extent. But it's going to be a long time before countries come to a decision on what principles they're prepared to abide by. Yeah, if they ever do. So, I think we've probably got enough for our presentation. It's only 15 minutes. OK, so I suppose we'll begin with some general historical background about why coastal cities were established. But we don't want to spend too long on that. The other students will already know a bit about it. It's all to do with communications and so on. Yes. We should mention some geographical factors, uh, things like wetlands and river estuaries and coastal erosion and so on. We could have some maps of different cities with these features marked. On a handout, you mean? Or some slides everyone can see? Yeah, that'd be better. It'd be good to go into past mistakes in a bit more detail. Did you read that case study of the problems there were in New Orleans with flooding a few years ago? Yes. We could use that as the basis for that part of the talk. I don't think the other students will have read it, but they'll remember hearing about the flooding at the time. Hmm. OK. So that's probably enough background. So then we'll go on to talk about what action's been taken to deal with the problems of coastal cities. OK. What else do we need to talk about? Maybe something on future risks, looking more at the long term if populations continue to grow? Yeah, we'll need to do a bit of work there. I haven't got much information, have you? No, we'll need to look at some websites. Shouldn't take too long. OK, and I think we should end by talking about international implications. Maybe we could ask people in the audience. We've got people from quite a lot of different places. That'd be interesting if we have time, yes. So now, should we go on? Producing enough energy to meet our needs has become a serious problem. Demand is rising rapidly because of the world's increasing population and expanding industry. Burning fossil fuels like gas, coal and oil seriously damages the environment, and they'll eventually run out. For a number of years now, scientists have been working out how we can derive energy from renewable sources, such as the sun and wind, without causing pollution. Today, I'll outline marine renewable energy, also called ocean energy, which harnesses the movement of the oceans. Marine renewable energy can be divided into three main categories. Wave energy, tidal energy, and ocean thermal energy conversion. And I'll say a few words about each one. First, wave energy. Numerous devices have been invented to harvest wave energy with names such as Wave Dragon, the Penguin, and Mighty Whale 
and research is going on to try and come up with a really efficient method. This form of energy has plenty of potential, as the source is constant, and there's no danger of waves coming to a standstill. Electricity can be generated using onshore systems, using a reservoir or offshore systems. But the problem with ocean waves is that they're erratic, with the wind making them travel in every direction. This adds to the difficulty of creating efficient technology. Ideally, all the waves would travel smoothly and regularly along the same straight line. Another drawback is that sand and other sediment on the ocean floor might be stopped from flowing normally, which can lead to environmental problems. The second category of marine energy that I'll mention is tidal energy. One major advantage of using the tide, rather than waves, as a source of energy, is that it's predictable. We know the exact times of high and low tides for years to come. For tidal energy to be effective, the difference between high and low tides needs to be at least five meters. And this occurs naturally in only about 40 places on Earth. But the right conditions can be created by constructing a tidal lagoon, an area of seawater separated from the sea. One current plan is to create a tidal lagoon on the coast of Wales. This will be an area of water within a bay at Swansea sheltered by a U-shaped breakwater, or dam, built out from the coast. The breakwater will contain 16 hydro turbines, and as the tide rises, water rushes through the breakwater, activating the turbines, which turn a generator to produce electricity. Then, for three hours as the tide goes out, the water is held back within the breakwater increasing the difference in water level until it's several meters higher within the lagoon than in the open sea. Then, in order to release the stored water, gates in the breakwater are opened. It pours powerfully out of the lagoon, driving the turbines in the breakwater in the opposite direction and again generating thousands of megawatts of electricity. As there are two high tides a day, this lagoon scheme would generate electricity four times a day, every day, for a total of around 14 hours in every 24, and enough electricity for over 150,000 homes. This system has quite a lot in its favour. Unlike solar and wind energy, it doesn't depend on the weather. The turbines are operated without the need for fuel, so it doesn't create any greenhouse gas emissions, and very little maintenance is needed. It's estimated that electricity generated in this way will be relatively cheap, and that manufacturing the components would create more than 2,000 jobs, a big boost to the local economy. On the other hand, there are fears that lagoons might harm both fish and birds, for example, by disturbing migration patterns and causing a build-up of silt, affecting local ecosystems. There are other forms of tidal energy, but I'll go on to the third category of marine energy, ocean thermal energy conversion. This depends on there being a big difference in temperature between surface water and the water a couple of kilometers below the surface, and this occurs in tropical coastal areas. The idea is to bring cold water up to the surface using a submerged pipe. The concept dates back to 1881. When... Hi, come and take a seat. Thank you. My name's Carl Rogers and I'm one of the doctors here at the Total Health Clinic. So I understand this is your first visit to the clinic? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I hope you'll be very happy with the service you receive here. 
So if it's all right with you, I'll take a few details to help me give you the best possible service. Sure. So can I check, first of all, that we have the correct personal details for you? So your full name is Julie Ann Garcia? That's correct. Hi, come and take a seat. Thank you. My name's Carl Rogers and I'm one of the doctors here at the Total Health Clinic. So I understand this is your first visit to the clinic? Yes, it is. OK. Well, I hope you'll be very happy with the service you receive here. So if it's all right with you, I'll take a few details to help me give you the best possible service. Sure. So can I check, first of all, that we have the correct personal details for you? So your full name is Julie Ann Garcia? That's correct. Perfect. And can I have a contact phone number? It's 219-442-9785. OK, and then can I just check that we have the correct date of birth? October 10th, 1992. Oh, I actually have 1991. I'll just correct that now. Right, so that's all good. Now I just need a few more personal details. Do you have an occupation, either full-time or part-time? Uh, yes, I work full-time in Esther Hazy's, you know, the restaurant chain. I started off as a waitress there a few years ago, and I'm a manager now. Oh, I know them. Yeah, they're down on 114th Street, aren't they? Uh, that's right. Yeah, I've been there a few times. I just love their salads. <laughs> that's good to hear. Right, so one more thing I need to know before we talk about why you're here, Julie, and that's the name of your insurance company. It's Cawley Life Insurance. That's... C-A-W-L-E-Y. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, Julie, let's look at how we can help you. So tell me a little about what brought you here today. Well, I've been getting a pain in my knee, the left one. Not very serious at first, but it's gotten worse, so I thought I ought to see someone about it. That's certainly the right decision. So how long have you been aware of this pain? Is it just a few days, or is it longer than that? Longer. It's been worse for the last couple of days, but it's three weeks since I first noticed it. It came on quite gradually, though, so I kind of ignored it at first. And have you taken any medication yourself or treated it in any way? Um, yeah, I've been taking medication to deal with the pain, Tylenol, and that works okay for a few hours, but I don't like to keep taking it. Okay. And what about heat treatment? Have you tried applying heat at all? No, but I have been using ice on it for the last few days. And does that seem to help the pain at all? A little, yes. Good. Now, you look as if you're quite fit normally. I am, yes. So do you do any sport on a regular basis? Yes, I play a lot of tennis. I belong to a club, so I go there a lot. I'm quite competitive, so I enjoy that side of it as well as the exercise, but I haven't gone since this started. Sure. And do you do any other types of exercise? Uh, yeah, I sometimes do a little swimming, but usually just when I'm on vacation. But normally I go running a few times a week, maybe three or four times. Mm. So your legs are getting quite a pounding, but you haven't had any problems up to now? No, not with my legs. I did have an accident last year when I slipped and hurt my shoulder, but that's better now. Excellent. And do you have any allergies? No, none that I'm aware of. And do you take any medication on a regular basis? Well, I take vitamins, but that's all. I'm generally very healthy. OK. Well, let's have a closer look and see what might be causing this problem. If you can just get up... We'll be arriving at Branley Castle in about five minutes. But before we get there, I'll give you a little information about the castle and what our visit will include. So, in fact, there's been a castle on this site for over 1,100 years. The first building was a fort constructed in 914 AD for defence against Danish invaders by King Alfred the Great's daughter, who ruled England at the time. In the following century, after the Normans conquered England, the land was given to a nobleman called Richard de Vere, and he built a castle there that stayed in the de Vere family for over 400 years. However, when Queen Elizabeth I announced that she was going to visit the castle in 1576, it was beginning to look a bit run down, and it was decided that rather than repair the guest rooms, they'd make a new house for her out of wood next to the main hall. She stayed there for four nights, and apparently it was very luxurious. 
but unfortunately it was destroyed a few years later by fire. In the 17th century, the castle belonged to the wealthy Fennis family, who enlarged it and made it more comfortable. However, by 1982, the Fennis family could no longer afford to maintain the castle, even though they received government support, and they put it on the market. It was eventually taken over by a company who owned a number of amusement parks. But when we get there, I think you'll see that they've managed to retain the original atmosphere of the castle. When you go inside, you'll find that in the staterooms, there are lifelike moving wax models dressed in costumes of different periods in the past, which even carry on conversations together. As well as that, in every room, there are booklets giving information about what the room was used for and the history of the objects and furniture it contains. The Castle Park's quite extensive. At one time, sheep were kept there, and in the 19th century, the owners had a little zoo with animals like rabbits and even a baby elephant. Nowadays, the old zoo buildings are used for public displays of paintings and sculpture. The park also has some beautiful trees, though the oldest of all, which dated back 800 years, was sadly blown down in 1987. Now, you're free to wander around on your own until 4.30, but then, at the end of our visit, we'll all meet together at the bottom of the Great Staircase. We'll then go on to the Long Gallery, where there's a wonderful collection of photographs showing the family who owned the castle a hundred years ago having tea and cakes in the conservatory. And we'll then take you to the same place where afternoon tea will be served to you. Now... If you can take a look at your plans, you'll see Branley Castle has four towers joined together by a high wall, with the river on two sides. Don't miss seeing the Great Hall. That's near the river in the main tower, the biggest one which was extended and redesigned in the 18th century. If you want to get a good view of the whole castle, you can walk around the walls. The starting point's quite near the main entrance. Walk straight down the path until you get to the south gate, and it's just there. Don't go on to the north gate. There's no way up from there. There'll shortly be a show in which you can see archers displaying their skill with a bow and arrow. The quickest way to get there is to take the first left after the main entrance and follow the path past the bridge. Then you'll see it in front of you at the end. If you like animals, there's also a display of hunting birds, falcons and eagles and so on. If you go from the main entrance in the direction of the south gate, but turn right before you get there instead of going through it, you'll see it on your right, past the first tower. At 3pm, there's a short performance of traditional dancing on the outdoor stage. That's right at the other side of the castle from the entrance and over the bridge. It's about ten minutes' walk or so. And finally, the shop. It's actually inside one of the towers, but the way in is from the outside. Just take the first left after the main entrance, go down the path and take the first right. It's got some lovely gifts and souvenirs. Right, so we're just arriving. So, Rosie and Martin, let's look at what you've got for your presentation on woolly mammoths. OK, we've got a short outline here. Thanks. Uh, so, it's about a research project in North America. Yes, but we thought we needed something general about woolly mammoths in our introduction to establish that they were related to our modern elephant, and they lived thousands of years ago in the last Ice Age. Maybe we could show a video clip of a cartoon about mammoths, but that'd be a bit childish. Or we could have a diagram. It could be a timeline to show when they lived, with illustrations. Or we could just show a drawing of them walking in the ice. No, let's go with your last suggestion. Good. Then you're describing the discovery of the mammoth tooth on St. Paul's Island in Alaska and why it was significant. Yes, the tooth was found by a man called Russell Graham. 
He picked it up from under a rock in a cave. He knew it was special. For a start, it was in really good condition, as if it had been just extracted from the animal's jawbone. Anyway, they found it was six thousand five hundred years old. So why was that significant? Well, the mammoth bones previously found on the North American mainland were much less recent than that. So this was really amazing. Then we're making an animated diagram to show the geography of the area in prehistoric times. So originally, St Paul's Island wasn't an island; it was connected to the mainland, and mammoths and other animals like bears were able to roam around the whole area. Then the climate warmed up and the sea level began to rise. And the island got cut off from the mainland, so those mammoths on the island couldn't escape. They had to stay on the island. And in fact, the species survived there for thousands of years after they'd become extinct on the mainland. So why do you think they died out on the mainland? No one's sure. Anyway, next we'll explain how Graham and his team. Identified the date when the mammoths became extinct on the island. They concluded that the extinction happened 5,600 years ago, which is a very precise time for a prehistoric extinction. It's based on samples they took from mud at the bottom of a lake on the island. They analysed it to find out what had fallen in over time: bits of plants, volcanic ash, and even DNA from the mammoths themselves. It's standard procedure, but it took nearly two years to do. So why don't you quickly go through the main sections of your presentation and discuss what actions needed for each part? Okay. So for the introduction, we're using a visual. So once we've prepared that, we're done. I'm not sure. I think we need to write down all the ideas we want to include here. Not just rely on memory. How we begin the presentation is so important.、Mm, you're right. The discovery of the mammoth tooth is probably the most dramatic part, but we don't have that much information. Only what we got from the online article. I thought maybe we could get in touch with the researcher who led the team and ask him to tell us a bit more. Great idea. What about the section with the initial questions asked by the researchers? We've got a lot on that, but we need to make it interesting. We could ask the audience to suggest some questions about it, and then see how many of them we can answer. I don't think it would take too long. Yes, that would add a bit of variety. Then the section on further research carried out on the island, analysing the mud in the lake. I wonder if we've actually got too much information here. Should we cut some? I don't think so, but it's all a bit muddled at present. Yes, maybe it would be better if it followed a chronological pattern. I think so. The findings and possible explanations section is just about ready, but we need to practice it so we're sure it won't overrun. I think it should be okay, but yes, <laughs> let's make sure. Hmm. In the last section, relevance to the present day, you've got some good ideas, but this is where you need to move away from the ideas of others and give your own viewpoint. Okay, we'll think about that. Now, shall we show you some of the? In this series of lectures about the history of weather forecasting, I'll start by examining its early history. That'll be the subject of today's talk. Okay, so we'll start by going back thousands of years. Most ancient cultures had weather gods, and weather catastrophes such as floods played an important role in many creation myths. Generally, weather was attributed to the whims of the gods, as the wide range of weather gods in various cultures shows. For instance. There's the Egyptian sun god Ra and Thor, the Norse god of thunder and lightning. Many ancient civilizations developed rites such as dances 
in order to make the weather gods look kindly on them. But the weather was of daily importance. Observing the skies and drawing the correct conclusions from these observations was really important. In fact, their survival depended on it. It isn't known when people first started to observe the skies, but at around 650 BC, the Babylonians produced the first short-range weather forecasts based on their observations of clouds and other phenomena. The Chinese also recognized weather patterns and by 300 BC, astronomers had developed a calendar which divided the year into 24 festivals, each associated with a different weather phenomenon. The ancient Greeks were the first to develop a more scientific approach to explaining the weather. The work of the philosopher and scientist Aristotle in the 4th century BC is especially noteworthy as his ideas held sway for nearly 2,000 years. In 340 BC, he wrote a book in which he attempted to account for the formation of rain, clouds, wind and storms. He also described celestial phenomena such as halos, that is, bright circles of light around the sun, the moon and bright stars, and comets. Many of his observations were surprisingly accurate. For example, he believed that heat could cause water to evaporate, but he also jumped to quite a few wrong conclusions, such as that winds are breathed out by the earth. Errors like this were rectified from the Renaissance onwards. For nearly 2,000 years, Aristotle's work was accepted as the chief authority on weather theory. Alongside this, though, in the Middle Ages, weather observations were passed on in the form of proverbs, such as red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. Many of these are based on very good observations and are accurate, as contemporary meteorologists have discovered. For centuries, any attempt to forecast the weather could only be based on personal observations. But in the 15th century, scientists began to see the need for instruments. Until then, the only ones available were weather vanes to determine the wind direction and early versions of rain gauges. One of the first, invented in the 15th century, was a hygrometer which measured humidity. This was one of many inventions that contributed to the development of weather forecasting. In 1592, the Italian scientist and inventor Galileo developed the world's first thermometer. His student Torricelli later invented the barometer, which allowed people to measure atmospheric pressure. In 1648, the French philosopher Pascal proved that pressure decreases with altitude. This discovery was verified by English astronomer Halley in 1686, and Halley was also the first person to map trade winds. This increasing ability to measure factors related to weather helped scientists to understand the atmosphere and its processes better, and they started collecting weather observation data systematically. In the 18th century, the scientist and politician Benjamin Franklin carried out work on electricity and lightning in particular, but he was also very interested in weather and studied it throughout most of his life. It was Franklin who discovered that storms generally travel from west to east. In addition to new meteorological instruments, other developments contributed to our understanding of the atmosphere. 
people in different locations began to keep records, and in the mid-19th century, the invention of the telegraph made it possible for these records to be collated. This led, by the end of the 19th century, to the first weather services. It was not until the early 20th century that mathematics and physics became part of meteorology, and we'll continue from that point next week. Hello, Flanders Conference Hotel. Oh, hi. I wanted to ask about conference facilities at the hotel. Have I come through to the right person? Mm -hmm, you have. I'm the customer services manager. My name's Angela. So, how can I help you? Well, I'm calling from Barrett and Stanson's. We're a medical company based in Perth. Oh, yes? And we're organising a conference for our clients to be held in Sydney. It'll be held over two days and we're expecting about 50 or 60 people. When were you thinking of having it? Sometime early next year, like the end of January. It'd have to be a weekend. Ah, uh, let me see. Our conference facilities are already booked for the weekend beginning January the 28th. We could do the first weekend in February. How about January the 21st? Ah, uh, oh, I'm afraid that's booked too. Well, let's go for the February date then. So, that's the weekend beginning the 4th. Okay. Now, can you tell me a bit about what conference facilities you have? Sure. So, for talks and presentations, we have the Tesla room. Sorry? Tesla. That's spelled T-E-S-L-A. It holds up to 100 people and it's fully equipped with a projector and so on. How about a microphone? Yes, that'll be all set up ready for you. And there'll be one that members of the audience can use too, for questions if necessary. Fine. And we'll also need some sort of open area where people can sit and have a cup of coffee. And we'd like to have an exhibition of our products and services there as well, so that'll need to be quite a big space. Mm-hmm, that's fine. There's a central atrium with all those facilities, and you can come before the conference starts if you want to set everything up. Great. And I presume there's Wi-Fi? <laughs> oh, yes. That's free and available throughout the hotel. Okay. Would you also like us to provide a buffet lunch? We can do a two-course meal with a number of different options. What sort of price are we looking at for that? Well, I can send you a copy of the standard menu. That's $45 per person. Or you can have the special for $25 more. I think the standard should be OK, but yes, send me the menu. Now, we're also going to need accommodation on the Saturday night for some of the participants. I'm not sure how many, but probably about 25. So, what do you charge for a room? Well, for conference attendees, we have a 25% reduction. So, we can offer you rooms at $135. Normally, a standard room's $180. And does that include breakfast? Sure. And, of course, guests can also make use of all the other facilities at the hotel. So, we've got a spa where you can get massages and facials and so on. And there's a pool up on the roof for the use of guests. Oh, great. Now, what about transport links? The hotel's downtown, isn't it? Yes. It's about 12 kilometres from the airport. But there's a complimentary shuttle bus for guests. And it's only about 10 minutes walk from the central railway station. OK. Now, I don't know Sydney very well. Can you just give me an idea of the location of the hotel? Ah, uh, well, it's downtown on Wilby Street. Uh, that's quite a small street and it's not very far from the sea. And of course, if the conference attendees want to go out on their Saturday evening, there's a huge choice of places to eat. Then, if they want to make a night of it, they can go on to one of the clubs in the area. 
There are a great many to choose from. Okay. So, if we go ahead with this, can you give me some information about how much we're looking at? Hello. Do you mind if I ask you some questions about your journey today? We're doing a customer satisfaction survey. Yes, OK. I've got about 10 minutes before my train home leaves. I'm on a day trip. Great. Thank you. So, first of all, could you tell me your name? It's Sophie Bird. Thank you. And would you mind telling me what you do? I'm a journalist. Oh, really? That must be interesting. Yes, it is. So, was the reason for your visit here today work? Actually, it's my day off. I came here to do some shopping. Oh, right. But I do sometimes come here for work. OK. Now, I'd like to ask some questions about your journey today, if that's OK. Yes, no problem. Right. So, can you tell me which station you're travelling back to? Stormforth, where I live. Ah, can I just check the spelling? S-T-A-U-N-F-I-R-T-H? That's right. Mm-hmm. And you travelled from there this morning? Yes. OK, good. Next, can I ask what kind of ticket you bought? I assume it wasn't a season ticket, as you don't travel every day. That's right. No, I just got a normal return ticket. I don't have a rail card, so I didn't get any discount. I keep meaning to get one because it's a lot cheaper. Yes, you'd have saved 20% on your ticket today. Oh. So you paid the full price for your ticket? I paid £23.70. OK. Do you think that's good value for money? Not really. I think it's too much for a journey that only takes 45 minutes. Yes, that's one of the main complaints we get. So, you didn't buy your ticket in advance? No. I know it's cheaper if you buy a week in advance, but I didn't know I was coming then. I know. You can't always plan ahead. So, uh, did you buy it this morning? No, it was yesterday. Right. And do you usually buy your tickets at the station? Well, I do usually, but the ticket office closes early and I hate using ticket machines. I think ticket offices should be open for longer hours. There's always a queue for the machines and they're often out of order. Mm, a lot of customers are saying the same thing. So, to answer your question, I got an e-ticket online. OK, thank you. Now, I'd like to ask you about your satisfaction with your journey. So, what would you say you were most satisfied with today? Well, I like the Wi-Fi on the train. It's improved a lot. It makes it easier for me to work if I want to. That's the first time today anyone's mentioned that. Oh. It's good to get some positive feedback on that. Mm. And um, is there anything you weren't satisfied with? Well, normally the trains run on time and are uh, pretty reliable, but today there was a delay. The train was about 15 minutes behind schedule. Mm, OK, I'll put that down. Now, I'd also like to ask about the facilities at the station. You've probably noticed that the whole station's been upgraded. What are you most satisfied with? Uh, I think the best thing is that they've improved the amount of information about train times, etc., that's given to passengers. It's much clearer. Before, there was only one board, and I couldn't always see it properly, which was frustrating. That's good. And is there anything you're not satisfied with? Let's see. I think things have generally improved a lot. The trains are much more modern, and I like the new cafe... But one thing is that there aren't enough places to sit down, especially on the platforms. OK. So I'll put seating down, shall I, as the thing you're least satisfied with? Yes, OK. Can I ask your opinion about some of the other facilities? Mm -hmm. We'd like feedback on whether people are satisfied, dissatisfied, or neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. OK. What about the parking at the station? Well, to be honest, I don't really have an opinion, as I never use it. So, neither satisfied nor dissatisfied for that, then? Yes, I suppose so. OK, uh, and what about the... As chair of the Town Council Subcommittee on Park Facilities, 
I'd like to bring you up to date on some of the changes that have been made recently to the Croft Valley Park. So if you could just take a look at the map I handed out, let's begin with a general overview. So, the basic arrangement of the park hasn't changed. It still has two gates, north and south, and a lake in the middle. The cafe continues to serve an assortment of drinks and snacks and is still in the same place, looking out over the lake and next to the old museum. We're hoping to change the location of the toilets and bring them nearer to the centre of the park, as they're a bit out of the way at present, near the adventure playground, in the corner of your map. The formal gardens have been replanted and should be at their best in a month or two. They used to be behind the old museum, but we've now used the space near the south gate, between the park boundary and the path that goes past the lake towards the old museum. We have a new outdoor gym for adults and children, which is already proving very popular. It's by the glass houses, just to the right of the path from the south gate. You have to look for it, as it's a bit hidden in the trees. One very successful introduction has been our skateboard ramp. It's in constant use during the evenings and holidays. It's near the old museum, at the end of a little path that leads off from the main path between the lake and the museum. We've also introduced a new area for wild flowers to attract bees and butterflies. It's on a bend in the path that goes round the east side of the lake, just south of the adventure playground. Now, let me tell you a bit more about some of the changes to Croft Valley Park. One of our most exciting developments has been the adventure playground. We were aware that we had nowhere for children to let off steam and decided to use our available funds to set up a completely new facility in a large space to the north of the park. It's open year-round, though it closes early in the winter months, and entrance is completely free. Children can choose whatever activities they want to do, irrespective of their age. But we do ask adults not to leave them on their own there. There are plenty of seats where parents can relax and keep an eye on their children at the same time. Lastly, the glass houses. A huge amount of work has been done on them to repair the damage following the disastrous fire that recently destroyed their western side. Over £80,000 was spent on replacing the glass walls and the metal supports, as well as the plants that had been destroyed, although, unfortunately, the collection of tropical palm trees has proved too expensive to replace up to now. At present, the glass houses are open from 10am to 3pm Mondays to Thursdays, and it's hoped to extend this to the weekend soon. We're grateful to all those who helped us by contributing their time and money to this achievement. The gardens have really been a... OK, Jack, before we plan our presentation about refrigeration, let's discuss what we've discovered so far. Fine, Annie, though I have to admit I haven't done much research yet. Nor me, but I found an interesting article about ice houses. I'd seen some 18th and 19th century ones here in the UK, so I knew they were often built in a shady area or underground, close to lakes that might freeze in the winter. Then blocks of ice could be cut and stored in the ice house. But I didn't realise that insulating the blocks with straw or sawdust meant they didn't melt for months. The ancient Romans had refrigeration too. I didn't know that. Yes. Pits were dug in the ground and snow was imported from the mountains, even though they were at quite a distance. 
the snow was stored in the pits. Ice formed at the bottom of it. Both the ice and the snow were then sold. The ice cost more than the snow, and my guess is that only the wealthy members of society could afford it. I wouldn't be surprised. I also came across an article about modern domestic fridges. Several different technologies are used, but they were too complex for me to understand. You have to wonder what happens when people get rid of old ones. You mean because the gases in them are harmful for the environment? Exactly. At least there are now plenty of organisations that will recycle most of the components safely. But of course, some people just dump old fridges in the countryside. It's hard to see how they can be stopped. Unfortunately, in the UK we get rid of three million a year altogether. That sounds a lot, especially because fridges hardly ever break down. That's right. In this country, we keep domestic fridges for eleven years on average, and a lot last for twenty or more. So, if you divide the cost by the number of years you can use a fridge, they're not expensive compared with some household appliances. True. I suppose manufacturers encourage people to spend more by making them different colours and designs. I'm sure when my parents bought their first fridge, they had hardly any choice. Yes, there's been quite a change. Right. Let's make a list of topics to cover in our presentation and decide who's going to do more research on them. Then later we can get together and plan the next step. Okay. How about starting with how useful refrigeration is and the range of goods that are refrigerated nowadays? Because of course it's not just food and drinks. No, I suppose flowers and medicines are refrigerated too. And computers. I could do that. Unless you particularly want to. No, that's fine by me. What about the effects of refrigeration on people's health? After all, some of the chemicals used in the 19th century were pretty harmful, but there have been lots of benefits too, like always having access to fresh food. Do you fancy dealing with that? I'm not terribly keen, to be honest.、Mm, nor me. My mind just goes blank when I read anything about chemicals. Oh, all right then. I'll do you a favour. But you owe me, Jack. Okay. What about the effects on food producers, like farmers in poorer countries being able to export their produce to developed countries? Something for you, maybe? I don't mind. It should be quite interesting. I think we should also look at how refrigeration has helped whole cities, like Las Vegas, which couldn't exist without refrigeration because it's in the middle of a desert. Right. I had a quick look at an economics book in the library that's got a chapter about this sort of thing. I could give you the title if you want to do this section. Not particularly, to be honest. I find economics books pretty heavy going as a rule. Okay, leave it to me then. Thanks. Then there's transport and the difference that refrigerated trucks have made. I wouldn't mind having a go at that. Don't forget trains too. I read something about milk and butter being transported in refrigerated railroad cars in the USA right back in the 1840s. I hadn't thought of trains. Thanks. Shall we have a separate section on domestic fridges? After all, they're something everyone's familiar with. What about splitting it into two? You could investigate 19th and 20th century fridges, and I'll concentrate on what's available these days. And how manufacturers differentiate their products from those of their competitors. Okay, that'd suit me. Hi, everyone. In this session, I'll be presenting my research about the social history of Britain during the Industrial Revolution. I particularly looked at how ordinary lives were affected by changes that happened at that time. This was a time that saw the beginning of a new phenomenon: consumerism. Where buying and selling goods became a major part of ordinary people's lives. In fact, it was in the 19th century that the quantity and quality of people's possessions was used as an indication of the wealth of the country. Before this, the vast majority of people had very few possessions, but all that was changed by the Industrial Revolution. This was the era from the mid 18th to the late 19th century. When improvements in how goods were made, as well as in technology, triggered massive social changes that transformed life for just about everybody in several key areas. First, let's look at manufacturing. When it comes to manufacturing, 
we tend to think of the Industrial Revolution in images of steam engines and coal. And it's true that the Industrial Revolution couldn't have taken place at all if it weren't for these new sources of power. They marked an important shift away from the traditional water mills and windmills that had dominated before this. The most advanced industry for much of the 19th century was textiles. This meant that fashionable fabrics and lace and ribbons were made available to everyone. Before the Industrial Revolution, most people made goods to sell in small workshops, often in their own homes. But enormous new machines were now being created that could produce the goods faster and on a larger scale, and these required a lot more space. So large factories were built, replacing the workshops and forcing workers to travel to work. In fact, large numbers of people migrated from villages into towns as a result. As well as manufacturing, there were new technologies in transport, contributing to the growth of consumerism. The horse-drawn stagecoaches and carts of the 18th century, which carried very few people and goods and travelled slowly along poorly surfaced roads, were gradually replaced by the numerous canals that were constructed. These were particularly important for the transportation of goods. The canals gradually fell out of use, though, as railways were developed, becoming the main way of moving goods and people from one end of the country to the other. And the goods they moved weren't just coal, iron, clothes and so on. Significantly, they included newspapers, which meant that thousands of people were not only more knowledgeable about what was going on in the country, but could also read about what was available in the shops. And that encouraged them to buy more. So faster forms of transport resulted in distribution becoming far more efficient. Goods could now be sold all over the country instead of just in the local market. The third main area that saw changes that contributed to consumerism was retailing. The number and quality of shops grew rapidly, and in particular, small shops suffered as customers flocked to the growing number of department stores, a form of retailing that was new in the 19th century. The entrepreneurs who opened these found new ways to stock them with goods and to attract customers. For instance, improved lighting inside greatly increased the visibility of the goods for sale. Another development that made goods more visible from outside resulted from the use of plate glass, which made it possible for windows to be much larger than previously. New ways of promoting goods were introduced too. Previously, the focus had been on informing potential customers about the availability of goods. Now, there was an explosion in advertising trying to persuade people to go shopping. Flanders claims that one of the great effects of the Industrial Revolution was that it created choice. All sorts of things that had previously been luxuries, from sugar to cutlery, became conveniences. And before long, they turned into necessities. Life without sugar or cutlery was unimaginable. Rather like mobile phones these days.